So, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to the third appointment of the Climate Finance Lectures Workshop and Webinar Series organized by uh, Fondazione Ani Enrico Mattei. I'm Riccardo Spani, researcher here in, in FAM, and I'm here with uh, Mrs. Sara Lovisolo, uh, Group Sustainability Manager at the London Stock Exchange Group and a member of the EU Technical Expert Group on uh, Sustainable Finance. Thank you, Sara, for being here with us. Uh, I'm taking you also on behalf of uh, Professor Stefano Pareglio, who is the scientific coordinator of uh, the Firms and Cities Transition uh, Towards Sustainability Research Program here developed in, uh, in FEM. Um, this, this, this program, this research program, uh, is dedicated to topics uh, that relate to energy transition and transition towards a, a more circular economy with a particular focus on, on firms and, and cities. Uh, we adopt a scientific approach, uh, making use of quantitative methodologies and tools alongside a, a qualitative approach. Uh, to support our research activities, we organize uh, dissemination events, uh, which provide valuable occasions uh, to confront with, between stake, uh, stakeholders, uh, share experience and best practices, and favor discussion on emergent topics that regard uh, various aspects that uh, characterize the sustainability um, subject. Um, in this context, we, we observe with great attention uh, the evolution of the regulatory framework uh, and the policy actions adopted uh, at national and international level. Um, let me remind you um, other appointments that we cover uh, with uh, our our, our dissemination series, um, Professor Rigobon and Professor Gunther, respectively from Mid Sloan uh, School of Management and University of Dresden, will present results of two papers they've written on the relationship between firms' financial performance and the environmental performance. Professor, Professor Xepapadeas from University of Athens and Bologna will discuss the impact of climate change uh, on monetary policy actions and how spatial economic, economics can be useful uh, when dealing with uh, environmental and resource economics. Two workshops will be dedicated uh, to climate disclosure and tools and methodologies to assess the financial impact of climate-related risks and opportunities. These events will, be, uh, will present best practices and offer a chance uh, to discuss and confront uh, each other on these particular topics. As I said, uh, this afternoon, Ms. Lovisola will give us an update on the implementation process of the action plan on sustainable finance that the European Commission has launched in 2018, providing insights on what will be the next steps uh, that will be made in order to achieve the targets that the European Commission has set within the United Nations 2030 Agenda and the Sustainable Development Goals. As mentioned earlier, Ms. Lovisola is responsible for sustainability management and strategy uh, at London Stock Exchange Group. Um, she has been an active member of the consultative group of the UN-backed Sustainable Stock Exchanges Initiative uh, since 2014. And in 2018, joined the steering committee of FC4S, the uh, UNEP-supported network for, uh, of financial, financial centers for sustainability. Uh, she also is co-chair of the working group tasked uh, with setting up the government-backed Italian uh, Sustainable Financial Center, following her involvement in 2016 in the Italian National Dialogue on Sustainable Finance as co-chair of the Capital Market Working Group. Correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong. Um, she has a master um, in, in economics from Bocconi University and has co-authored a number of publication on the impact of taxations on cost of capital. Uh, she also has a postgraduate certificate in applied anthropology from University of uh, Milan Bicocca. Before leaving the floor uh, to our speaker, I would like to thank uh, Professor Pareglio and FEM staff for making this event possible. And of course, NET Community and the Italian Forum for Sustainable Finance who collaborated in the realization of the webinar. And finally, also our partners, uh, SIPEM, Adwea, Acea, Catholic Assicurazioni, Assicurazioni Generali, Unipol SAI, and uh, Utilitalia, who support us con constantly in this dissemination activity of ours. Finally, let me remind you that 
uh, Mr. Lovizolo's presentation will be available on uh, the event website and on the uh, facts uh, website. And then at the end of uh, the presentation, there will be a Q&A session. So please feel free to write your questions in the in the question section of the of the dashboard of the platform. Um, Ms. Luisolo, please, you may you may begin. Thank you, uh, thank you, Ricardo, for the introduction, and uh, um, um, thank you uh, to uh, Fem for the opportunity to, um, uh, to present on the uh, uh, EU uh, uh, action plan on, uh, on sustainable finance. Um, I have uh, um, a few slides that I that will support um, that will support the um, the presentation, but I cannot see them now. So just give me. Uh, a few uh, a few seconds to uh, to uh, bring them up. So uh, today's topic is a, a status update on the EU action plan uh, on sustainable finance. Uh, this uh, is a bit old, as Ricardo mentioned, it was launched in 2018. So uh, we are uh, two years into the process of delivering uh, the proposal from the Commission. And the um, action plan was part was an idea of the uh, older uh, of the last commission so uh, of the uh, Juncker commission uh, and uh, now with a um, uh, with the uh, von der Leyen commission uh, it has to be uh, reviewed uh, a revised sustainable finance strategy will be put forward uh, but the delivery stage uh, is still underway the sustainable finance action plan is linked to a series of policies uh, of, of e european policies uh, mostly supporting uh, climate change uh, it supports uh, the uh, european union's commitments under the paris agreement in terms of reductions in uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, policies regarding the um, the percentage of renewable energy, the share of renewable energy in, uh, in, in the EU consumption and the share of energy efficiency. Uh, these are quantitative targets uh, to um, set through to 2030. Uh, when the new commission uh, was established, uh, President von der Leyen uh, as a first step decided to launch a new policy called the European Green Deal which is a, a political commitment taken by most EU countries excluding uh, Poland to transform the, Euro the European economy so that by 2050 it's going to be carbon neutral. Uh, this implies that all the targets under uh, the um, uh, the uh, legislated um, commitments will have to be uh, to be revised. It's not been easy. The, uh, the climate law um, has been put forward for discussion. Uh, an agreement has not been reached, but this is still part of the process. There are implications in terms of um, uh, fin funding of this plan. Uh, it's estimated that public finance won't be enough, but it would be necessary to crowd in private money and investors' money to achieve uh, these goals. When uh, looking at the funding side of these ambitious plans, there are uh, three uh, levers that can be used, the EU budget, 
uh, blended finance uh, that is uh, using public guarantees to uh, improve the risk profile of certain investment and uh, encourage private investment uh, to uh, get in. This is blended finance and private finance is where the commission action plan uh, comes in. Uh, so how can private finance be used to scale up uh, the transition to a low carbon economy to accelerate uh, this transition and the action plan was fundamentally made up of 10 actions each of them supported by sub actions and uh, i have to say that over the course of um, uh, the past two years a lot of progress has been made uh, regulations have been approved and passed, uh, supporting standards have been developed, and uh, this is a good foundation for the next stage. Uh, the Commission has launched a consultation on sustainable finance, uh, on the renewed sustainable finance strategy uh, that closed on the 15th of July. So we'll see a new series of proposals coming out of this uh, commission that will inform the uh, future of sustainable finance uh, up to uh, 2024. Uh, we won't go through all the actions of the action plan, we'll focus mainly on, uh, here you have a, uh, hopefully you can see um, better in, in, um, in this layout, uh, but we'll focus on taxonomy, uh, uh, on uh, disclosures, so an action one taxonomy will focus on disclosures by financial market participants, um, uh, action seven, and will focus on corporate sustainability disclosures, action uh, nine, and will also um, provide, also provide an update on another important action that is the integration of ESG considerations in uh, investment advice. So. Um, questions on sustainability preferences of uh, the customers of banks and uh, uh, of insurance undertakings um, that are included in the MIFID II and IDD uh, regulation. So uh, there will be a separate um, update on, on, on this very important uh, intervention, a part of the, uh, of the action plan. Uh, so, first off, taxonomy. Uh, taxonomy, uh, the, the EU taxonomy is a list of sustainable activities. Um, and uh, that is a list of activities that contribute in a significant way to the achievement of six environmental objectives. And uh, it's uh, the, uh, the, the content of a regulation which has been recently uh, adopted um, by, the, uh, by the European Union. Now, the taxonomy regulation is published in the official journal, but uh, this regulation is not complete. So maybe you have heard that the taxonomy has been adopted, but the taxonomy per se, this list of sustainable activities does not exist yet. So, um, the uh, technical expert group on sustainable finance, um, of which I'm a member, has advised the Commission on the list uh, of sustainable activities. Uh, but it's just advice. So the Commission st has still time to um, exactly provide the technical screening criteria for each activity. And this will will be the content of delegated acts. And there will be uh, uh, two batches of delegated acts. So the first delegated acts to be delivered by the Commission by the end of this year will just cover two of the six environmental objectives, climate change and, uh, um, uh, adapt and, and climate change mitigation and climate change adaptation. Then the uh, technical screening criteria for the other four objectives, uh, water, circular economy, pollution control, 
and um, and um, and waste and, and the biodiversity uh, will be delivered by the end of 2021. So, even though the taxonomy has been adopted, the the the, the framework, the taxonomy framework has been adopted, uh, we don't have it yet. Uh, the Commission will appoint uh, a new expert group called uh, Sustainable Finance Platform. Uh, they have launched a call for applications and by September it will be up and running. And this group will advise the Commission on the next, um, on, the, uh, on the four objectives on which the TAG uh, were, was not asked to provide, uh, to provide uh, advice. So, uh, still some way to go. Uh, the taxonomy regulation also includes uh, uh, obligations. So there will be obligations for investors to, to disclose uh, the percentage of their environmental products. So if only if they have environmental funds, investors will have to say the percentage of the holdings that is aligned with the taxonomy. So uh, to be clear, this just applies to funds that are marketed in the EU as environmental or sustainable. It does not apply to, the, to other funds. Uh, issuers, banks and insurance undertakings captured by the non-financial reporting directive will have to disclose the revenues or investment or capex that um, derive from products and services eligible for the taxonomy and uh, this um, re will require a, a further delegated act specifying the details so by the 30th of june of 2021 the commission will have to issue uh, a delegated act with the details about how to disclose this exposure to taxonomy activity if you are an, a listed company a bank or uh, an insurance undertaking um, the, uh, these obligations will come into force from the 1st of January 2022. So uh, still a bit of time uh, to ensure that the market absorbs the requirement uh, before uh, the requirement comes into force. So if the first batch of delegated acts is finalized by the 31st of December this year, and there are no delay due to COVID-19, then there will be one year's time to get ready to disclose uh, in 2022. Then moving uh, to uh, disclosures by financial market participants, so Action 7, uh, this is another important re regulation. This was uh, published in the official journal uh, in December uh, 2019. It's, a, it's the key regulation, I think, of the Sustainable Finance Action Plan uh, because uh, it uh, captures all investors uh, in Europe and makes sustainable investment uh, uh, standard. So sustainable investment is the standard. Smaller investors can depart from uh, adopting sustainable investment practices but they have to explain why. So the expectations set by this regulation is that all sorts of investment in Europe, asset owners, asset managers, uh, hedge fund, uh, adopt sustainable investment practices in their governance, in their uh, investment policies and their risk management. And uh, if they have fewer than 500 employees, they can comply or explain. If they are larger, they just have um, to comply and uh, also run a uh, uh, sort of due diligence uh, process and, and publish a due diligence statement around uh, their practices. But there, as, as for the taxonomy, this regulation is not complete. So it, it requires supporting regulatory standards so that investors can discharge uh, the obligations. They understand exactly what is expected of them. 
So what's happening now is that ESMA, EOPA, and EBA, so uh, the authorities overseeing financial markets, um, uh, in insurance and pension funds, and uh, banks, forming a, a joint committee, are consulting of the regulatory technical standards supporting uh, this regulation. And the disclosures they are putting forward are two types. There are disclosures that have to be made at the entity level. So if you are an investor, you have to say, uh, you have to disclose your approach uh, to um, uh, sustainable investment, but also you have to demonstrate you don't do significant harm, or you have to disclose your adverse impact uh, using the wording of the regulation. And so, uh, the supervisory authorities are consulting on a series of KPIs and processes and, uh, and um, uh, uh, reports uh, for publication uh, that try and capture those uh, adverse uh, impacts. Uh, the consultation is open until uh, the 1st of October and uh, uh, it, it's a very important one. So uh, this is important not just for investors but also uh, for issuers uh, because this regulation triggers the demand for sustainable data uh, from issuers. So if you, if you are a corporate, if you're a listed company, uh, now you can be pretty sure that all your disclosures uh, will be, will be you know, uh, eagerly reviewed by investors uh, aggregated, uh, used to be made responsible investment decisions that will be used to report externally on the uh, sustainable investment practices of, uh, of an investor. Some other, some other disclosures by investors will be at the product level instead. Uh, one of these is the do no significant harm disclosure, for example. And uh, uh, there's a there's a debate in the sustainable investment industry as to the relevance of the proposed disclosures, the ability of uh, investors to provide those data points, because it, it, it's, not, uh, it's not easy to standardize uh, this type of information. It's the first time that such disclosures are required at the aggregate level. So uh, it, it, one thing is to disclose information at the product level, quite another when you address the whole asset under management of, uh, of an investor. So it, it, it's a challenge, can be, uh, it can be difficult, but we'll see the outcomes of the uh, consultation and how uh, the um, uh, ESAs, so the, 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 the uh, supervisory authorities will um, shape the regulatory standards based on the input they uh, they have received. And I think this is a nice segue into uh, the, the action nine about corporate sustainability uh, disclosures. Within the action plan, uh, the key action was to integrate uh, a framework for climate-related disclosures called TCFD. Uh, I think that all uh, the members of the uh, the DERISCO uh, group um, uh, convened by um, uh, FEM will be familiar with that, but in any case it's the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures. And uh, uh, this is a global standard focused on uh, the financial implications of climate-related risks and opportunities for uh, investors, banks, insurance undertaking, and listed companies. The action uh, was to issue guidance that would integrate the, re the uh, requirements included in the non-financial reporting directive. Uh, this guidance was based on the advice provided by the tech, by the technical expert group, and uh, this, uh, a communication was issued in June uh, 2019 uh, sharing uh, this voluntary uh, 
guidelines uh, as to deliver disclosures uh, based not necessarily on the TCFD, but climate-related disclosures that were both compatible with the principles of the non-financial reporting directive and would take into account uh, the key recommendations from the TCFD. So this action has been uh, has been completed. Uh, the non-binding guidance, however, are non-binding, and uh, they include best practice um, uh, recommendations or, um, let's say, give data preparer's choice, there's uh, now been a consultation uh, launched to um, review the framework uh, of, of the, uh, in which these recommendations uh, were uh, provided, that is the main regulation, the non-financial reporting uh, directive. This was announced, this review of the Non-Financial Reporting Directive was announced by um, Vice President Dombrovskis, who is the uh, commissioner in charge of the uh, sustainable finance uh, strategy, as, well, as, as, the key, uh, as the key action uh, for uh, in the sustainable finance space and for the next um, four years of uh, activity of the Commission uh, alongside the taxonomy. So it's a very important one. And uh, um, a consultation on the review of the Non-Financial Reporting Directive has been uh, extensive. And um, um, there are many uh, options, many, many avenues that can be, um, uh, let's say, pursued one of the options is that the EFRAG, uh, the body that looks after accounting standards, also issues a non-financial reporting standards. Uh, so the Commission has now officially asked EFRAG to provide advice on whether it's, it's, and how uh, a non-financial uh, reporting standards should be established and along with which lines, along which principles. So, uh, EFRAG is setting out to uh, provide recommendations to the commissions of these. Uh, those of you who have taken part in the consultation on the revised non-financial reporting directive have seen how many areas have been touched upon uh, from, you know, um, materiality uh, and the importance of the principle of materiality to uh, the scope of the regulation. So who should be disclosing just the companies with more than 500 employees, smaller companies, uh, listed companies, private companies. There, there were a lot of, uh, a lot of questions. Uh, this is a preliminary consultation. We haven't seen a text, a proposed text uh, of the new, of the revised non-financial reporting directive yet, uh, but it will be, um, uh, the uh, topic of another uh, of another uh, consultation. Uh, further reading, uh, given that considering the, uh, the the time we have uh, today, we cannot go into uh, much detail. Further reading is provided by the publications by the tech by the technical expert group. So you can uh, see here uh, a number of publication with the uh, we published a disclosure uh, report uh, that was put out for consultation. Uh, the taxonomy uh, was the uh, subject matter of uh, a few reports, I have to say, and uh, uh, more than 1,000 pages uh, overall. So there was a first report in June. Um, that was consulted upon, and uh, a, a, another two reports were published in in March. Uh, a high-level document plus a technical, uh, very detailed report on the taxonomy. And um, uh, the uh, the Commission also launched a further consultation on these uh, on these report uh, in April. We are not. Uh, touching on them this time, but the 
CAG also published um, a report on the benchmarks, uh, on climate-related uh, benchmarks and ESG disclosures uh, for benchmarks. And now these, the process here has been completed, so uh, the benchmark regulation um, uh, has been uh, has been published in the, in the official journal, and the de delegated acts uh, uh, were adopted uh, by the Commission last week. Now they are out. There's a three month period before uh, the delegated acts become final. Uh, and the Green Bond Standard uh, was also uh, the um, subject of two reports from the TAG, and uh, uh, there's a consultation uh, underway. The, uh, that will close in um, uh, that will close, I think, uh, on the first of October as well. And uh, there are many questions on the EU Green Board Standard also as part of the uh, renewed uh, sustainable finance strategy. So uh, next next step, uh, what lies ahead with just with regards. Um, to the uh, sustainable finance action plan of 2018, so the old action plan. Uh, so uh, the, the, the main regulations are taxonomy and the disclosures regulation. So taxonomy, uh, just to summarize uh, the next step I mentioned uh, earlier. So we are expecting in December 2020, the adoption of delegated acts of um, that is the details about the list of sustainable finance activities supporting climate change mitigation and climate change adaptation. So this is the first batch of delegated acts expected uh, by December 2020. Um, then. Uh, we uh, are expecting in December 2021, in, sorry, in June 2021, uh, uh, we are expecting the delegated acts on disclosures by uh, issuers, banks, and um, insurance undertakings captured by the NFRD, so taxonomy-related disclosures by NFRD, uh, NFRD uh, data providers. And then in December 2021, uh, we are expecting the adoption of the delegated act regarding uh, taxonomy activities addressing the other four objectives uh, of the uh, the other four environmental objectives uh, of um, of the taxonomy. Uh, regarding the uh, disclosure regulation, uh, in March 2021, a few disclosures will be already. Um, uh, will be um, already uh, mandatory. In June 2021, uh, the regulatory technical standards will be reviewed in the light of the taxonomy regulation. And um, uh, so in the light of the first uh, delegated act, and then in June 2022, they will be reviewed in the light of the second batch of, uh, of delegated acts. One, once the taxonomy, the details of the taxonomy, the taxonomy are uh, available, also other regulation will be reviewed. So, for example, the benchmarks regulations, the one introducing two delegated acts, two, two, two types of um, climate benchmarks will be reviewed to take, a, uh, to take account of the fact that the taxonomy is there and can, be, uh, can be used to inform the methodologies of those two benchmarks. Uh, it's not possible to reference taxonomy now in those benchmarks because uh, the taxonomy does not uh, does not exist. You can see here also an update on the eco label. So the eco label is um, one of the uh, action uh, under uh, under labels and standards introduced by the the action plan. Uh, it's uh, it's a, a deep green label for funds, and it's strictly linked with the taxonomy as well. So uh, the methodology for uh, issuing the, the label is based on uh, alignment uh, with the taxonomy. It's been uh, the coming to 
uh, shared and agreed upon methodology for defining uh, how to assign this eco label has not been easy. So uh, the the expert group set up to come forward with a with a with a methodology has not uh, reached consensus, unfortunately. But in any case, the timetable uh, remained the same. So. Um, uh, the idea is that the eco label is still adopted by the Commission in September uh, 2021. Uh, and finally, another important uh, piece of, it's not really legislation because it's not the, 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 the object of regulation, but in, in another building block of the sustainable finance ecosystem is um, the suitability test. Uh, under MIFID II and IDD uh, and the IDD Directive, in Insurance Distribution Directive. Uh, so uh, this was one of the first action complete, actions completed by the Commission. Uh, the uh, Delegated Act was already published on the Commission website um, uh, probably in June, 20, in June 2018. Uh, what it needed uh, to uh, to come into force was a clear definition of what sustainable investment is. And this definition is provided by the disclosures regulation. So we needed to wait for the disclosures regulation, which embeds the uh, official definition of sustainable investment to come into force to um, for these uh, delegated acts to be uh, applicable. Uh, dates have not been set yet, but even for uh, this delegated act, there's going to be a consultation phase, um, then adoption of the commission, then three months time for the parliament and the council to provide any, any uh, objections, uh, publication in the official journal, and then 12 months uh, uh, time to allow uh, banks and insurance undertaking to absorb the requirements and uh, um, get ready uh, to implement them. So I think even in this process, uh, I, I, not, I cannot say plenty of time, but time has been built into the process to ensure that the market can uh, respond and get organized to make the, um, uh, the required changes to the organization tools uh, to interact with the public. Then, just to conclude very briefly on the, uh, uh, on the renewed sustainable finance strategy uh, as part of the Green Deal, uh, a public consultation, uh, 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 quite a long one, uh, has taken place. Uh, the window for, for contributing was between 8th of April and 15th of July. And uh, uh, the publication of the future strategies has been slightly delayed due to the COVID-19 crisis. It was expected for Q3 2020, also in, in conjunction with the COP26 summit, so the climate summit, which has been delayed as well. So now it's set, uh, we expected uh, uh, by the end uh, of this year. And this uh, future strategy will encompass a, a series of further, further inter intervention that will be uh, based on uh, input from stakeholders. And uh, both the taxonomy, uh, the, the non financial, the revision of the non financial reporting directive, all the action put in place by the old action plan will be uh, supporting uh, the European uh, Green Deal. And as we've seen, also the next EU uh, recovery fund, uh, which I think was discussed in previous. Um, seminars uh, embeds elements of sustainable finance. So there is this green oath uh, that should be applied uh, to any disbursement of funds. And uh, we don't know the details yet of uh, regarding how exactly the green oath will work, but uh, taxonomy will will play a role. Uh, will play a, ro a role uh, for sure. So that, that's all for me uh, in terms of uh, updates. And uh, we, I think, uh, Ricardo, we can open the floor to questions. Uh, 
Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sara, for uh, interesting insights. Um, I'm glad you, you talked about um, the TCFD and non-binding guidelines uh, topic. Uh, it's, uh, it's something that in, in FAM and particularly in the facts and the RISCO project, we, we look at with uh, great attention. Um, so before um, leaving the floor to the questions from the, from the audience, uh, I would like to ask uh, a question myself. Um, I'd say it's it's more uh, an opinion I would like to uh, to ask. In particular, um, consider uh, I mean the big amount of of, of funds um, that our country will receive uh, from the recovery fund, the new energetic strategy that puts hydrogen uh, more or less at the center of the energetic transition. And uh, the growing attention that ESG factors are receiving uh, from financial operators, uh, as Bain pointed out recently, uh, which underlines the considerable overperformance of ESG leaders in the stock's global 1800 uh, index, which is more or less 37% uh, more than their competitors since uh, 2013. Do you believe that uh, Italy can, can take on somehow the role of, uh, of leader in this uh, transition process towards uh, a more sustainable uh, economic system? So I, I, I work for the, for, the, for the London Stock Exchange Group and for Borsa Italiana. So I have exposure to you know, um, the performance of our listed companies on, uh, on ESG issues. And, uh, uh, Borsa Italiana is, I think, the fifth market for the quality of ESG disclosures globally. So uh, our companies have, uh, I think, um, early on understood the importance of sustainability uh, uh, for competitiveness. And I think this is also demonstrated by uh, the Italian Sustainability Day. So this year we had um, not a day, but a week of one-to-one uh, -one meetings between listed companies and, um, and investors just on ESG topics. We have uh, over 650 meetings on ESG, um, on ESG topics. And I think this uh, is a sign of the potential that our market has to capture this opportunity because the data is there. The, um, the interest from investors uh, is there. Uh, we have also significant experience, you know, through the issuance of green bonds, social bonds, sustainable bonds, transition bonds, in framing um, ESG issues into a strategy. Because this is the important thing: ability to uh, develop a, a, a long-term strategy. Uh, within which you can position the funds you get from the commission. If you already have a long-term view, a strategy that has been developed, and you can measure the result of your investment, I think whatever criteria they will outline for uh, the reporting on the impact of, 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 the, uh, of these funds, um, we, are, uh, we stand to benefit because we already have the tools, we already have uh, the ability uh, to articulate uh, a strategy that embeds ESG, uh, ESG considerations. Italy has also has got a lot of um, uh, smaller companies uh, belonging to many uh, sectors that have been harshly affected by the COVID-19 crisis. So if you think of tourism, of uh, uh, the hospitality sectors, they have must have been affected. Uh, we'll see uh, whether uh, the requirements uh, can be met also the, the, the very small businesses. But uh, we've seen signs of, uh, of these, for example, when working with it, uh, Borsa Italiana with the elite program, uh, we've been in touch with hundreds and hundreds of small companies that are really understanding uh, the importance of uh, their impact on society and their ability to, to engage stakeholders uh, to achieve uh, their long-term results. So I, I'm really optimistic here. Mm, yeah, um, I pretty much agree on, on your vision. 
just outlined. There is a question uh, that I'm I'm forwarding to you so that you can read it um, on your own and understand understand it a little bit better. Uh. You should be able to to read it on in the question section. Yeah, let me let me. No, it. I see it blank. I'm sorry. Can you read it aloud for me? Because um, okay. Um, in which country are uh, are there the law control of green bonds, green hedge funds, and etc. In Italy or in in UK, with low speed in Italy or UK. Um, in which countries are the, the? In which country there are the law contro con control for green bonds, green hedge funds, and etc. In Italy no, or no, in? Okay. Yeah. UK. So uh, uh, this uh, regulation applies uh, to all of Europe, all of Europe. So all the member states, and not the UK. I have to say because clearly now they are out of the uh, now they are, they are out of the EU. So all investors that are based in the UK, in the, so in the EU, uh, will have to adopt sustainable investment strategies, and uh, um, also uh, on the disclosure part, this will apply to global investors. So if you are an investor based in Japan and you want to uh, commercialize a product in the EU, saying that it's sustainable or environmental you will have to stick to a series of disclosures that the um, RTS from ESMA will uh, articulate and also we, you will have to disclose based on the taxonomy. So it, even if you're based in the US but you are commercializing uh, the product in the EU, you will have to comply. So uh, it's really, uh, as regards to product disclosures, um, a consumer protection element that protects uh, all uh, European uh, consumers, and um, uh, uh, and so it applies to investors regardless of their jurisdiction. The instead the uh, disclosures at an entity level. So what you do as an entity, these apply to uh, investors based in the European Union, in Italy included. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's another question um, regarding. Um, taxonomy. Um, they're asking if uh, you can name uh, a few sectors or activities uh, taxonomy compliant that are important for the uh, economic recovery in Italy. Uh, so uh, the, um, uh, the, the the sectors that are included in taxonomy are the sectors that are uh, potentially high carbon. Uh, so there's a variety uh, of activities there so you have um for example transport right so transport as uh, is high carbon per se but you can have the low carbon version of it that is electric vehicles clearly the automotive sector in italy has been hit it's been hit really hard uh but the uh, and so it's an important sector for the recovery but uh, clearly the taxonomy part of this is the electric vehicles part. And anything that is to do with, uh, for example, electrification of transport. So if you, from a utility perspective, if you are um, part of the utility sector, I, I believe that your ability to provide uh, recharging stations will feed into the uh, development of electric transport and uh, uh, in this way, we'll contribute to the recovery through that, um, through that sector. So just this, um, this is just an example. Another example can be maybe the construction sector can, uh, can contribute to the, to the, uh, to the recovery. Uh, the taxonomy includes cement production, which is key uh, to the construction sector. Uh, so cement production, if uh, carried out according to certain criteria, to certain standards, is captured uh, by the taxonomy. So the taxonomy is quite um, extended. It does not only comprise, you know, uh, renew renewable energy, 
it's it, it, it tries to um, capture uh, as much emissions uh, as possible also from a demand side uh, perspective okay um, another question um, this time this is ask uh, you've mentioned a range of expected delegated acts under the taxonomy regulation uh, will these all be preceded by a commission consultation enabling stakeholders to feed into the final formats as with uh, me feed the uh, to suitability delegate attack? Yes, yes. So uh, for every delegated act, there will be further consultation. So there, uh, especially with the taxonomy, they are trying to engage stakeholders on multiple levels. So for example, regarding the delegated acts, there was also consultation in April, the so-called roadmap or impact assessment. So they, even though they had done an impact assessment for the um, the uh, main regulations so of the level one regulation, they did an impact assessment also for the delegated acts, and they are expected. The commission is expected to submit an impact assessment uh, to a body uh, that oversees the issuance of regulation. So uh, there's a lot of scrutiny on uh, on the taxonomy regulation. Uh, the member state. Um, uh, advisory group, technical group, uh, will also have a say on the delegated act. So there will be further consultations and then an involvement, not just of the commission experts, but also of uh, a member state expert group representing uh, the Ministry of Environment, the Ministries of Environment, the Ministry of Finance of all the member states. So I think uh, they will be really, really careful uh, in drafting these delegated acts. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's a usual process in European Commission asking comments from Yeah, but if they, they, they've asked so many times. So in this case, I think they keep asking. Uh, I think they're quite worried of the pushback you might have because, um, you know, uh, this is considered really, uh, really critical. Not all the countries are at the same level of preparedness. So I think Italy is really ready to capture the opportunities. There are other countries that are really worried. Uh, they might not be in the same position. Mm, yeah, I mean, taxonomy has been a big issue, a big point uh, yeah. of discussion in the last year and a half, maybe. Yeah. So uh, there's another question. Now, now there is a boom of green bonds, but the green, uh, there is only in the marketing name as NL uh, in Italy with 38 coal-fired power plants. I hope that in the new, near future, uh, there will be more control about uh, this part of the, from the financial market. Uh, what do you think? Well, so um, uh, I think the 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 green bond market is quite a, a, a robust market. So I don't agree because the, the green bond market is a use of proceeds market. It's a, a use of proceeds. So uh, you don't have to be yourself green to issue a green bond. On the contrary, we are hoping that exactly the, those companies that are brown will issue a green bond to transition. Because it means that you make investments to be greener in the future. So if, you, it's not, if you're already green and you issue a green bond, okay, fantastic. But we are not seeing the change and the impact that you can see when a company that, has, uh, that can have uh, also significant part of the business um, involved in fossil fuels rate activities, issuing a green bond to invest to make that um, uh, to make investment in the green assets that will ensure that the green revenues in the future will be, play a bigger a bigger role. So uh, the green bond is a forward looking uh, tool. You make investment now to be greener uh, in in the future. So I'm uh, I'm really really comfortable that. Uh, you exactly uh, get what the green bond says because the process to ensure that the money is allocated in uh, in green projects uh, is really stringent. So um, um, it's totally fine if companies that are uh, engaged in high carbon activities issue uh, issue a green bond. Okay, um, I think I'll get last couple of questions. And I think we're almost uh, running out of time. Um, 
to asking from the audience, uh, why do you think it's so critical to develop a uh, taxonomy and why countries are taking so much time? I think uh, the, the reason for that maybe is, is related to the previous question. So because there is so, there's a lot of concern about greenwashing, right? So there is this idea that it's maybe too easy to, to say that what you do will make an impact uh, in the transition to a carbon economy. So uh, the Commission wanted to create a framework that guarantees the strictest possible uh, parameters uh, to say that something is, is green. So we are talking here of activities that significantly contribute to the transition. So just to give you an example, uh, energy has to, has to be produced uh, at uh, 100 gram uh, CO2 per kilowatt hour. It's, it's really, really low. It's really, really low. It's extremely uh, strict uh, as a criterion. And, uh, and also, it's not enough that you contribute to, for example, climate adaptation or, or mitigation. You also have to ensure you're not damaging the other four objectives. So if while you address mitigation, you don't damage uh, water, you don't damage a circular economy, or, uh, or you don't um, d d damage the biodiversity. So it's quite, uh, it's quite stringent. I believe the, the reason why uh, it's taken so long and there was such a, um, a heated debate around this in Parliament uh, between countries on the Council is that there is a fear that uh, a tool that was designed for a very specific objective, that is ensure that green investments are, uh, are green, will be used for everything. Right? And so all the po public policies uh, will be uh, constrained by that tool. Um, because uh, we, given the nature of this webinar, I focused on the obligations for the private sector. Uh, but the taxonomy can also be and must be used by member states when setting up incentives and policies uh, that are environmental. Uh, so you can in the future consider that, for example, the incentives that we now uh, have in place for making house, houses more energy efficient, energy efficient um, might be in the light of the taxonomy uh, uh, tightened up because that is a tax incentive and it has to be probably aligned with the taxonomy. So there are um, there are some uh, areas of concerns that derive by, I think, the public use, not the private sector use of, of this tool. Yeah, I believe it's also strictly related to the uh, productive structure of each country. Uh, last question, I would say. Uh, okay, energy companies, but which will be the control in the hedge funds, especially uh, big hedge funds like BlackRock that has 65% portfolio in fossil energy. Is it too big to control? So, but it's not, uh, so the, uh, the, um, it depends. So if, if this taxonomy, it's a disclosure regulation, right? So you have to disclose, you can say, uh, this product that, are, that, that it is green is aligned by 5%, with a taxonomy. So there's no threshold set uh, with regard uh, to products. But when it comes to your, um, uh, your activities, uh, the controls will be carried out through disclosure. So uh, the companies will have to publish all the data and, it will be, and who's controlling is the customers. So if the customers don't think that uh, a certain investors is green enough, they will switch to the investors who has better uh, disclosures, that has better policies. And in this way, uh, the um, asset owners, uh, so the pension funds, uh, also the end users, the beneficiaries uh, of, of pension funds, or even retail investors can compare like for like, can compare one provider to another provider and say, well, I think 
this one is greener or more sustainable because their policies and their data and their disclosures are more robust. And uh, I prefer this one. So uh, this is um, a tool to shift uh, allocations based on uh, on preferences. So I think um, it's the so-called uh, Pillar 3 tool or a tool based on transparency. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Sarah. Thank you, everybody, uh, for being here with us today. I hope uh, this has provided uh, useful insights on what will be the next policy action and steps that will be uh, taken in order to achieve these sustainable goals that have been set. Uh, before leaving you, uh, let me remind you two things. First of all, um, Sarah's presentation will be available on the event uh, website page. And um, let me remind you as well, uh, our next event, which is scheduled for the 14th of September, uh, Financial Risk and Monetary Policy Under Climate Change, uh, with uh, Professor Anastasios Kripavadeas from University of Athens and University of Bologna, who will discuss uh, the impact on climate, of climate change on monetary policy uh, actions. And um, we will discuss with uh, this topic with uh, Professor um, Costantini from University of uh, Roma III. Um, I think um, this is all. Uh, again, thank you, Sara. Thank, thank you. you. Um, thank you, friends, staff. Thanks to that community and Italian Forum for Sustainable Investment Forum. Uh, thank you to SIPEM, Adwea, Acea, Cattolica Assicurazioni, Assicurazioni Generali, Unipol, SAI, and Utilitalia for supporting us uh, constantly. And thanks uh, to the audience for um, participating at this event. Have, have a nice day.